So differential expression analysis. Uh, so here's some um, overall basics. Uh, under most circumstances, we're basically interested in the two sample problem. So if you've taken like an intro to stat class, this is, you know, you have two normal distributions and you want to check whether or not, or you want to test whether or not uh, the mean expression is the same in both populations or are both populations basically the same population, right? Um, so you, I'm sure you've all seen this, you know, the t-test, uh, you have these two different populations and how do you check, right? Um, and the main question, uh, so, so there's some, some quirks that uh, come from RNA-seq um, if we want to do this. So we're essentially looking at counts of things, and counts are um, understood to not be normally distributed, and a simple t-test won't suffice um, for a number of reasons, but that's like the biggest one. Um, expression is also relative, and it depends a lot on the samples that you're looking at, and it depends on how much differential expression there is in, uh, between the samples. Um, and we typically only have, uh, the, possibly the biggest problem is that we typically have only two to three samples in each condition. Um, I mean, you can imagine a scenario where you're trying to test uh, the height of, uh, the mean height of males and females across uh, like the human population. Um, you know, people have done this, like, you know, this overarching study, and it's, it's like true that, that men are on average taller than women, but you can imagine that if you took, you know, random samples of just two random men and two random women, your, your variance on this uh, test would be very, very high. And this is like sort of the same problem. Um, this is sort of a, a misnomer uh, that, that, or a misconception that people have uh, in RNA-seq. They say, you know, I, I'm sequencing like a billion reads. I'm doing like several different samples. Well, those billion reads, they only give you one observation, which is the number of counts on one particular transcript. It doesn't help the statistical power for doing uh, comparisons across samples. It only helps, you know, in identifying isoforms at a particular locus. It doesn't help for saying this transcript is differentially expressed in these two different conditions. For that, you need many more samples. Um, so basically, you have to have ways to deal with all of this, and I'll talk about how you deal with this in differential expression uh, in RNA-seq in a second. Okay, so to, to sort of attack this first problem here, uh, we, we sort of deviate from the, the classical model of, uh, of, you know, of assuming that these populations are normally distributed, and you assume um, often a negative binomial model. Uh, so there's several different parameterizations. Um, if you look up negative binomial, um, you might get a little confused because it doesn't really make sense in the context of RNA-seq. The model that you really are looking for is a negative binomial count model, or often called the NB2 model. Um, and this is the model that's assumed in like DE-seq2, DE-seq, uh, EDGE-R, and a whole host of other uh, tools. So you can also assume that the log counts is normal, or Gaussian uh, distributed. Uh, there's some, I mean, it's, I should say that no one actually believes that either one of these models is true, or at least I don't think that anyone believes that either one of these models are true. Um, but the truth is that you can actually, both of these models are fairly robust to misspecification, and that's why we use them. And people have shown that under many circumstances, they're, they're pretty robust. So uh, Sleuth is actually assuming uh, that the log counts is normal um, after you've done this, this uh, transcript uh, um, count um, inference. And uh, Lima assumes a similar thing across the genes, that the, the log counts across the genes are, um, are normally distributed. So there's a super rich class of uh, literature on dealing with uh, count models and testing in, in these situations. Um, you can do very uh, complicated experimental setups um, with uh, you know, linear models and generalized linear models. Um, you can deal with extra covariates such as batch effects. You can deal with paired designs which have, uh, like let's say if you're looking at tumor and uh, normal samples from the same patients, you can have some paired uh, tests that, that deals with, uh, with that variability correctly. Whereas you know, like a tool like Cuffdiff, for example, only deals with a very simple case where you're assuming that you have uh, random samples from two different populations. Um, which is not usually, uh, or often not true. I, I would say that that's probably the, the experiment that most people do, but a lot of people don't do that experiment. Um, okay, so between sample normalization. Okay, so we have basically two, two uh, samples, 
here we have some control and some treatment and the goal is to provide some scaling of the estimates so that they're comparable that the transcript level uh, estimates or the gene level estimates are comparable across samples so um, on the in the control uh, sample here I have uh, let's see two four five different genes um, gene one all the way to gene four and then I have a funky gene here and each one of them is getting only two counts, okay? And then in the treatment, something goes crazy with funky gene, and it takes up a ton of my sequencing depth. Um, so here I have gene one, gene two, gene three, and gene four. They all have only six reads, and um, funky gene has 76 reads. Um, and so one naive solution, which is uh, the original uh, sort of solution that a lot of people were taking was simply to take the total counts, right? So that basically means you take 10, you take uh, this number 2 and divide it by 10, and then you take this number here, um, 100, or sorry, you, you know, 6, and then you divide it by 100, and you sort of just take the proportion of this. Um, the problem is that you have differentially expressed things, and this estimate gets thrown off because of that. And in the next slide, I'll show you how you deal with that. but. Um, a better solution is to take a set of control genes or control features that hardly change in the expression and sort of uh, sum these and then divide by them and then do some sort of scaling uh, with this. And um, there are a number of different ways to do that. And so, you know, one way to deal with this is with um, spikins. Uh, spikins are sort of, it's unclear what, how good spikins are actually performing. There's been some papers that spikins, if you, uh, like this, this RUV seq uh, method, showed that basically spikins uh, by themselves, if you just treat them normally um, and don't do, if you do like the naive thing with a spikin, that it's actually not very good. Um, so yeah, you, you have to take care when you're doing, uh, uh, be, be careful when you're doing spikins. But uh, but anyway, so. This is, if you're not doing spikins, this is typically what you'll do. So let's say you have total count normalization, and here you see that, um, that in the control, everything has 0.2 expression, and then treatment, um, everything ex except uh, funky gene has a 0.06 expression. And what we did here was we just took all of the counts and we just divided by, uh, by the total counts, okay? And then if you're ex ex uh, excluding funky gene, because we have some information that basically tells us that uh, it's probably differentially expressed or it's an outlier in this experiment, then um, you can do this normalization summing over only the things that are, uh, are not differentially expressed or this null set, if you will. Um, and you get that everything is expressed with 0.5 uh, sorry, 0.25 in both uh, conditions, except for funky gene, right? Funky gene is now, is the one that appears differentially expressed, and the rest of the genes all look okay. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do, deal with this. Uh, you do this, you know, before you do the differential expression test, so that your differential expression test isn't messed up. Um, and uh, the most common ways to do this are TMM, which is, stands for trim mean of M values. And uh, there's also a method in the original DEC paper on how to deal with this. It's basically like uh, the, uh, the count, the median of the count over the geometric mean across the samples. And um, in many situations, these two estimates are very, very uh, similar to each other. Um, and by the way, I have references to all of these things on the slides. So you can pull down the slides and click uh, the references. And there's a bunch of references at the very end. Do, so does this make sense? This is kind of like a key point. Yeah, you don't want to look at just the um, the raw numbers ever compared to uh, and compare them across samples. You have to do some sort of normalization. Okay. Okay. So how do you deal with small sample sizes? So uh, your estimators have variance, right? Uh, and this is just sort of inherent from this random sampling that you're assuming, and um, and this variance sort of grows as your sample size decreases. So in very small samples, if you take, you know, if you take a sample of three from, uh, from some population a thousand times, you'll notice that it has a ton of variability. If you take a sample of a hundred from um, a population, you know, a thousand times, it'll have much less uh, variability in the small sample, right? So in, in some sense, there's, there's a large variance on your variance also, right? Because the main thing here that we're interested in in the differential expression test is uh, the variance estimate. And to deal with this, uh, you sort of shrink uh, your estimates and what that, 
it, it's sort of confusing what that means. Um, it has some sort of statistical meaning to a similar, um, but when we say shrinkage in, in um, in statistics, we basically mean we're going. We have two estimates. We have sort of our raw estimate, and then we have some other auxiliary estimate that might be um, like a prior on here. And we're basically shrinking the weights toward from the the raw thing that we saw towards some prior. Um, so you can imagine. I think my next slide. Okay, here you go. You can imagine one assumption that you might have is that. Ah, um, oh, geez, where's this cursor? I just lost it again. Okay. Anyway, you can, one common assumption is that the variance is a smooth function of the mean, which actually turns out to be a pretty decent assumption just due to the fact that we're looking at counts. Um, so on, uh, this, you can assume that basically your raw estimate is one of these dots. Each one of these dots is a particular gene. And then um, the sort of smooth estimate is this red line. Now, what you can do is you can take some linear combination between the red line and um, the blue dot that is your particular observation, and you can increase or decrease the weights depending on how much confidence that you have in your sample. Right? So, it's sort of, there's a ton of different ways to do this, um, and you know, the first original. Uh, uh, idea for this particular assumption, which is the, the smooth function assumption, uh, came from like the DEC paper in like 2011, where they literally just took the max of the red line and uh, the blue estimate. But now there's like a lot of a lot of other uh, ways. So a common way to do this is using an estimator called an empirical Bayes estimator, and there you have some like prior, and you set up a bunch of different uh, you know complicated functions on how you define what the weights are going to be. Um, yeah, any questions on this? So this is sort of a key principle. You're, you're basically, um, you're increasing your power by, by pooling all the information together, right? Because if, if, uh, if you only had one estimate, uh, you wouldn't be able to do this. But you're, you're uh, exploiting the fact that you have many, many different estimates across many different genes, and sort of together they give you some, uh, some information. Okay, so... Um, Let's talk about p-values for a second and what we typically mean uh, by a p-value in, uh, in this situation. So we, we have some, uh, in the, in the, the basic uh, two-sample hypothesis, we have um, some uh, null hypothesis, right? And this null hypothesis is that um, the mean of condition A and the mean of condition B is the same. Um, so the, the, the p-value in the situation and the test that we're performing is whether or not uh, the null hypothesis is, uh, sorry, whether the null is not true. Um, so the way that you frame this and the wording, you have to be careful with the wording, but the wording is very important in the situation. And it's basically the probability of observing some test statistic, at least this extreme, assuming that the null model is true. So there's a ton of things that can go wrong here. Um, if your model is misspecified, then the p-values are sort of meaningless. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so the main assumption is that under the, the null model that uh, um, you're assuming that your model is correctly specified, and then all of these things sort of fall out from them, and a few other assumptions as well. Um, and a test statistic, what, what do I mean by test statistic? So this is your classical Wobble-style uh, test, and it typically looks like this. Um, you would say, like, z is equal to you know, the, the uh, observed mean in condition A versus uh, minus the observed mean in condition B, and then the standard error of, uh, of these two estimates. So under the assumption of independence, you can simply sum the variance between uh, condition, uh, on mu A and mu B. And, uh, and that's the part that sort of trips us up a lot, right? So the means, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, we sort of are assuming we have a good estimate of the mean, which might not always be the case, but you can't really do too much about that one. Um, and also, this test can vary quite a bit depending on uh, what your assumptions are. Okay, so I'm almost done. I think we'll just go through. I'll skip a few of the slides at the end and talk a little bit about Sleuth, and then we'll we'll finish up for the coffee break. Um, so another thing that that we have to keep uh, track of and really uh, keep in the back of our minds actually in the forefront uh, in this type of analysis is, uh, you know, you have to keep track of multiple hypothesis testing. So you're testing thousands of samples at once, sorry, thousands of, uh, doing thousands of tests at once. And um, if you do this many, many times, 
you know, at every single test, you have the probability of, uh, of getting a false positive 5% uh, of the time. That's just like inherent in uh, statistics, um, assuming a, uh, a cutoff of uh, 0 0.05. So if you do this many, many times, you can actually, you know, it's, you will end up getting many, many false positives if you don't do some sort of correction. Um, so I'm going to skip this. This is some simulation showing how bad you could do. Um, but basically, you have uh, this, this notion of a, of a Q value, which is the P, uh, false discovery rate corrected uh, P value, which basically means it's slightly different than a P value in the sense that uh, the, the false discovery rate, or the FDR, is basically uh, the expected number of false discoveries over all of the discoveries um, at that rate. So if you take a FDR of 0.10, um, and assuming everything is correct, which, okay, so this is part of why a lot of these things end up in higher false positive rates, because these things aren't correct. But assuming everything is correct, um, you'll end up having 10% of those uh, discoveries actually not being real. Okay, so the short answer is that it's a, it's a multiple hypothesis corrected p-value. Um, but there's actually a slightly more uh, technical version of this, and if we could chat about what it is during the break if you're interested. Um, it doesn't exactly mean um, uh, this. Okay. Um, so one of the things from Sleuth is that we have this bootstrap, and the way that we do that is that we assume that we have this model, this multinomial model that I told you about earlier, and we can basically, now that, because Callisto is so fast, we can resample the data, and we get new estimates on the transcript level abundance estimates uh, using uh, the EM algorithm every single time. So in, in some sense, we're doing like in silico technical replicates. Okay. And um, we've, we did some experiments that basically show that if you take some sample that's really, really large and you subsample it, um, so this is in some sense as being a proxy for many technical replicates, that the bootstrap uh, variance actually uh, recapitulates that quite well. So the correlation is quite high. I think this example is from RAT. Okay, and often you make the assumption that the that the technical noise is uh, Poisson distributed, um, and there's some cases where this is very not true, um, especially in the case where you're doing transcript level abundance estimations. So here's um, just one lo locus, and it's very very complicated. At the and at the transcript level, you have a ton more variance than you would have expected, uh, just due to the fact that you're trying to deconvolute the transcript level estimates. Okay, so then the shrinkage that we do in Sleuth, this is like, I only have two or three slides left, uh, so we're going to coffee break soon. But uh, um, anyway, the assumption that we make here, this is very similar to the, this plot that you uh, saw at, um, from the, this uh, negative binomial model that I showed you earlier. Um, this, on the x-axis, you have the mean uh, expression. On the y-axis, you have this, uh, this uh, variance. And this variance that we have is, um, that we're assuming on the y-axis is, is basically uh, sort of just the biological and sort of uh, uh, sample-specific variants now. And we're assuming some additive model. And, and what that means is that we're assuming that there's some component of biological variability and there's some other component of technical variability. And what you're seeing here, there's a ton of uh, dots at the zero, um, along zero, and those are the, the samples where there's more technical variability, sorry, more, the transcripts where there's more technical variability than there is biological variability. And that basically is telling us that we're having a really hard time estimating the transcript level abundances because of the fact that that locus is very complicated. Now, the, the things in this sort of cloud in the, at the top are the things that we can actually estimate the, the variability of reasonably well. Um, and there is where we do our shrinkage. So that's basically the, the big difference between Sleuth and, um, and a lot of the other differential expression methods is that we have a, a way to keep track of the technical variability and sort of subtract it out and then do um, shrinkage just on the biological variability. Okay. So I think uh, we're pretty much done. I uh, just want to say that... Uh, you know, good practices to, to do reproducible analysis. Um, you know, GitHub and, and Git are both free um, if you have academic, uh, um, an academic email address, or GitHub, that is, is free if you have an academic email address. Um, I really, really am a big fan of SnakeMake, and we'll, we'll use it later in the demo. Um, it, we've, we did the uh, Callisto paper with it, we're doing the Sleuth paper with it, um, and we're basically putting a, 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 pun, a bunch of pipelines using SnakeMake um, online. Um, I, I think it's a great tool, we'll talk about it later.
Um, so, okay, just some f closing thoughts. Uh, so don't compare raw units without first doing normalization. Don't even do it once. Um, every choice that you make in the pipeline can affect the downstream results. Uh, so only try to deviate from the standard when you must. Um, and RNA-seq should be a tool for guiding uh, other experiments. Uh, don't take uh, RNA-seq results and assume that they're correct. Uh, assume that they're basically just a tool for guiding other experiments. Um, most results are speculative, especially with a, a small sample size, and they should be followed up with. Um, and then there's a list of other tools that you could use. Um, just want to acknowledge uh, my advisor, Lior, and uh, also Paul Melstead for lending me some slides and a bunch of references at the end. You can find all these on the PDF online. Okay. Thanks, and uh, I guess I'll take questions at the coffee break just so that you guys can stretch your legs and stuff.